my big commitments I want to make to everybody, both from, from Lucy's uh, class and from uh, Don and my class, is to be super respectful of uh, everyone's time and energy and staring at a screen for a long period of time. Uh, so we want to uh, really respect the process and, and keep things moving, but also give everybody a time to experience this kind of uh, distance collaboration. But I'll, I'll turn it back to Lucy, who can first say a hello and welcome, and then uh, I can go over just some logistics, and then we can dive. Right Hi, everyone from Chicago, Illinois. Um, my name is Lucy Gray, and I am an instructor uh, at National Lewis University, and we have seven of my students joining us uh, this afternoon. It's four about a little bit after four here in Chicago. And I know Rashawn and Don um, through a, a bunch of uh, different activities. Rashawn and I are both Apple Distinguished Educators. And then Don and I have worked on a variety of projects with innovation um, over the past couple years. So um, I'm really excited to collaborate with you guys today. And uh, uh, I think it's going to be a really great experience. Uh, my students right now are in a course on staff development, and most of them are towards the end of their master's degree program. They are mostly practicing educators. Um, one is, has stepped out of the classroom temporarily while she's uh, raising her kids. Another is just getting started, and the rest are, are working in, in, mo in the high school and, and, and elementary classrooms. Um, so I think this might be their last course, so they might have one more course to go, and most of them will be done with their master's degree program. They are going to be doing um, a benchmark project at the end where they have to design a professional development experience, and so this is going to be very helpful to them. What I'm hoping that they will do today is uh, listen to your projects and use the feedback protocol that Rashana is going to go through in a second and give you some concrete advice for improving what you're doing. Um, and then they're also going to write a reflection in the next week or so uh, about how they would design a professional development activity to support whatever you're doing. And so hopefully we'll, we'll give you that feedback in about a week or so as well. So um, without further ado, I'll turn it back to Rashan and he can tell us um, how we should proceed. Great, thanks Lucy. And so, uh, well, students in MSTU 4029 uh, know me by now, or at least a little bit. Good to see everyone. Thanks for joining. And, and students from, from NLU, uh, this is a, a terrific uh, honor and opportunity to do this collaboration for the second year. Um, and this year we've, I think, taken the, the dip aspect to a, uh, and the video aspect to, to a new level. So it's really exciting to see how this will all um, play out. You know, my background in, in knowing Luce on the different professional networks probably starts at, at Apple Distinguished Educators, but also probably like through the like TEDx community. I think that's where I first heard Lucy speak uh, at like the second TEDx NYED event. And uh, I was like, oh, I'm going to follow her on Twitter. And then eventually our, our paths collided. <laughs> yeah, that, that was so, a long time ago. Um, yeah, yeah. So let me, uh, let me dive right into um, what's going on here. So I'm using, the students are very familiar that I'm always using explain everything and not because um, I have a close association to it as one of the founders, but hopefully it's useful in setting these. Um, students from NLU, uh, you should have access to these two cases that um, are just kind of problems or frames for students in, in, in my class to be able to kind of thoughtfully apply some of their previous learnings, prior knowledge, and come up with interesting, thoughtful, and slightly academically skewed responses. Um, we, we do these kind of mini casework uh, projects in, in groups and often in randomized groups because the tail end of our course later this spring uh, is a much more um, detailed development and design project, and we think the scaffolding of having uh, small group projects leading up to that help serve the final group project work better. So you're kind of coming in the middle um, of this kind of meta uh, learning exercise around um, working groups and teams and learning people's strengths and um, uh, limitations to some degree because we all have them. Um, the way this is going to go is we're going to go in order based on these 
group numbers. So group one is going to go first. I'm going to keep a very strict 10 minute limit. I've been given the power of co-host, meaning I can hit the mute all button and silence, silence the talking. Um, and uh, don't feel you don't lose or like miss out on a prize. If we hit 10 minutes, like this is, this is part of the learning too, like understanding how to work within a constraint of time and attention and things like that. And then we'll roll right into uh, a feedback protocol. And I think we will use the zoom uh, chat as a place for students from NLU or even students from uh, MSTU um, to to use this and the framework is very simple. It's something that uh, is used frequently at Stanford's D school, which is I lick. Uh, sorry, not I like. Lick. I like. I wish. And what if? And after observing, encountering, engaging with something, you use the I like prompt to basically point out something you like. I like Zoom because uh, it's very easy to click a link and it seems to just work at least after the first time. I wish, I wish Zoom made it easy to share a file like Lucy said. What if, what if I could just think something and Zoom would act automatically do it? Obviously that's impossible, but like that might be a way for me to like frame my thinking on an experience uh, and that's a way for you to structure feedback. Now students who are on the receiving end of the feedback Often your first instinct when getting feedback is to get into a, uh, like a defensive posture or basically counter any wordage coming your way as far as uh, criticism or critique or um, anything like that. And the, the best skill that you can practice here is listening and saying, uh, thank you, we'll consider that. Thank you, I'm glad you noticed that. Thank you, would you like to know more about, we thought about that. This way you turn it into a dialogue as opposed to like a dissertation defense. Um, and the best thing you can do in a feedback session is, is to listen, take it back, go back to the design table and iterate. So you're almost to a degree where um, we're all going to work on even our, our listening skills here. Um, so, uh, oh, good. You're facilitating. Interest. Awesome. I love this parallel discourse. So I'm going to unshare from here, unless there's any questions and feel free to unmute and, and like talk. Uh, you don't have to like, you're not restricted to uh, chat. The only thing that's helpful with the mute is that, you know, ambient noise times 30 becomes no longer ambient, but um, quite disruptive. So I'm going to stop my screen share, but let's uh, open up for questions. And if not, we'll I'll let group one start to get technically set up. And if group one needed to remember who they were, uh, this is you group one. Any questions? Rashawn, I do have a question. Are NLU students aware of even the big? They are now. But not as of like a week ago. So this is all. all really need to... Yeah, so, so it, it's still in, in, in fresh memory, but they have access to them. And they've also uh, been given the heads up that three groups are working on one of the prompts and one group's working on the other. Uh, what will be helpful, though, because a lot of uh, the groups have taken added additional context or uh, define some previously vague parameters, uh, just make sure you set that up to say like, oh, we're looking at a high school class maker program set in Northeast, Northeast United States or whatever. So um, you, can't make, you can't go wrong by helping to define uh, or redefine or restate um, the scenario. Okay, cool. So. Um, Let's see if, if group one, um, the, the, the floor is yours. Uh, I'll, I'll give a grace period before I start timer. I'm gonna start it on my phone here. Um, but uh, let, let's get you guys set up. Um, let's see. Okay, so uh, we'll get started here. Our uh, option that we chose to tackle uh, was at um, Teachers College. Essentially, we requested the explanation of the various systems, um, sites, and services that typical students are used, uh, or, or sorry, are asked to use as part of their uh, learning. And we have mapped that journey out and created a number of different uh, suggestions based on what we found. Ah, there we go. Okay, now you can see uh, how we're doing here. Excellent. Okay. All right. 
So we're going to get started, and uh, basically we titled this Trek in the Digital Spaces of Penn State because the challenges are like an arduous trek. It's not a fun walk in the park. It takes uh, quite a bit of time for you. Okay, so let's get started. So we titled this Trekking the Digital Spaces of TC because it represents a more arduous journey than perhaps a short walk in the woods. So moving forward. So what we have here is the uh, kind of uh, overview of what a student may have questions about um, when they're coming to TC. So in the first week of school, <laughs> Thank you. So in the first week of school, uh, you know, we're getting ready for classes, students are getting acclimated, um, but TC provides little, if any, guidance on how to navigate its online spaces, and this can be detrimental to, you know, in-person students as well as online students. Um, students are left to figure it out on their own. So some of these questions that a student may have are where are my class websites? Um, is there a campus map? Does my class have a website? How do I print? Is there software available? And then there's numerous other questions that a student may have, but unfortunately they are not um, adequately presented to, and from the answers to those questions are not adequately presented to a student at first start. So this piece um, or this video here is going to walk you through a process of how to print something or how many steps it takes to print something uh, here at TC. So you have a challenge to count how many clicks it actually takes um, to get there. I can't hear it. You guys can't hear it. Great. Now I'm at the Teachers College uh, homepage here, and it gives me a lot of different information. I'm tweeting over here, Instagram, community information that's going on. I want to go to this courses tab here and that will bring me to Canvas and Canvas is where all the information for my classes is stored. So I'm going to click on Canvas and that brings me to my files for all the classes I took in the fall and currently have in the spring. As you can see that it is currently organized in alphabetical order so not by semester which is a little bit frustrating. I know that for technology tonight I have a few articles to read so I'm going to click on that course. I'm going to click on I like, I wish, I wonder. So this is something I want to have printed out for class tonight. I'm going to download it, give it on um, in downloads. And now I need to go to the paw print system, which is Columbia's uh, printing center or uh, app program that lets you print. Click on my print center. Again, I need to log in. And it's already here, but uh, to upload a document, um, I know it's in the downloads. So I'd have to find it in downloads. Refresh button. And then I, next step would be to go to the library and enter um, all my information again in the paw print system. All right, great. Well, I'm hoping that you got the sense that that uh, example was both a bit arduous and uh, a bit mind numbing. And that's kind of the sense that we wanted to uh, get across. It's the idea that it's not quite easy to navigate some of the spaces. And so to give you a kind of a more general overview, on uh, navigating through some of the digital spaces in a typical day for a student. Uh, we have here a journey map. Uh, on the x-axis on the bottom is the, uh, the central overview of the journey itself, starting from before class 
and going until the end of class and leaving. Uh, and along the y-axis, we've charted uh, the ease of the experience. The higher it is, the easier something is, the lower it is, the harder something is. So, so I'll begin with the left side and essentially the high point of everything that we just showed you is opening Chrome because your Chrome web page is probably a little bit more customized and more attractive to look at. And from there, the ease of experience just goes down. Um, you can see that using my TC isn't easy. You can see that reaching all those course materials and the more clicks that you have to do within Canvas, the more arduous it becomes. And then of course, printing is an extra step as well. So in order to access all of those materials, sometimes it can take, can anyone guess how many clicks it was? It was the answer B, 15. It's 15 clicks for you to print one article off of your class materials. Great, and so after you get into class, you might find yourself settling in, opening up your laptop, getting things ready, needing to access all the documents. I, we've kind of charted that uh, fairly low in terms of the easy experience because some students may need to be booting up their computer for the first time and reopening up uh, all of these different applications. Uh, after that, a lot of students like to use their own material and, or applications, ones that they're familiar with to take notes. Uh, that can include things like Google Keep, Google Docs, and Google Slides. And and, and then finally, upon leaving class or even just before leaving class, preparing to leave, students may use Google Calendar and Canvas to start to organize and schedule things. And that's kind of a bit more in the middle, depending on which application you use. Google Calendar may be a bit more easy to use, whereas scheduling things through Canvas and walking through finding the syllabus uh, may be a bit more difficult. So we've put that somewhere in the middle. Okay, so based on our observation, we have three general recommendations for TC's digital spaces. The first one is to update the UI design. As you can see, it seems that TC's digital space designer tried to put everything on the whole page. So it's kind of overwhelming. So we think they should update the UI design and eliminate the unnecessary elements that would decrease the system's um, efficiency. And the second one is to give students a customized experience to make their encounter with the system easier. We all have different needs with, uh, when using TC's digital resources. So a complete customized experience based on our own needs and interests would be very helpful. And the last one is collaboration tools. Within collaboration of the class can help students <clears throat> develop real world skills like teamwork, communication, and problem solving. So TC should have its own incorporating technology to further enhance uh, student collaborations. Now for this part, what you can see is that we've created all of these elements of the MyTC and Canvas pages from left to right, not useful, neutral, slightly useful, mostly useful, and very useful. So we've tried to organize these into different categories so that you can see the main issues here are that there's excessive unnecessary information and the formatting is very unfocused, so it makes it difficult to navigate. And then, of course, the recommendations for the new MyTC portal are that we would advocate for a personalized front page. And this was an idea that we came up with a week or two ago. And um, in class, we realized that personalization allows you to get exactly where you want to go when you want to get there. So we would advocate for three customized menus so that instead of having to navigate through the Instagram and the Twitter, if you're not interested in those things, you can take them off of the front page. This would also allow it to be more task focused to get exactly what you need, what you think more important. If you're a work study student, you can put payroll on your customized front page. Or if you're scheduling classes quickly, you can put registration up there. This would also allow for more of an integration of systems so that if you don't use the TC Google Drive, you don't need to have that link there. Uh, okay, so this is the um, journey map that we hope to achieve after these uh, modifications to the MyTC Hub or the um, just uh, making the whole system or more uh, as a whole. 
So as you can see, the using my TC function here is more uh, satisfying or it's more useful. And you can see we can just uh, reach different tasks rather directly. So we don't have to dig through tens of materials to either print or just um, open new uh, applications to take notes. We really want to have a uh, centralized uh, system that we can benefit from just uh, directing everything from my TC. And these are our citations. Thank you so much. We look forward to hearing any questions. Awesome, guys. You, you, you only went six seconds over. <laughs> I, you, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very soft. I didn't have the guts to hit the mute button. So. But other groups, it's still, it's still a viable option for me. But terrific. That, that was great. I'll, I'll, I'll stop speaking. I'll let students. Uh, uh, And also sc uh, scrub through the, the chat. You've got some uh, old questions there too that you could uh, address in uh, spoken. Uh, we asked, how did you embed the web page in the presentation? Great. I see one question. Do you use Slack through TC or is it something you're using with this class specific? That's from Lucy, right? And the answer to that is that um, me and a couple people in our group both had experiences with one professor who preferred to use Slack. So it was in addition to the required Canvas page as an LMS, but the Canvas page was essentially just a link to the Slack. And so he used Slack as his particular form of an LMS. That was the professor's decision. Yeah, Slack has, takes a little bit of getting used to for some people. It's a little different. And I think I love it, but and it has really cool integrations, but it's something that I, I don't know, it's just very different. Um, and then Tegrity, I looked it up and that's a, a lecture capture system that was on your list? Yes. Okay, because we use D2L, which that's is- used by our university. Okay, all right, that's awesome. Um, the one thing I wanted to add that I liked was the chart that you had where you ranked things as being useful or more important than other things in terms of the redesign. And I think that mm -hmm. is really useful. And that's something that I would use um, I could see my students using that kind of approach when they're uh, when they're doing their benchmark projects. They might want to adapt something like that um, when we're evaluating each other's projects. So I really, really, really like that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll share my uh, I like I wish I wonder. So. Uh, I like really liked the, the click exercise that video. Um, I, I wrote wrote down in my notes visualize the hideousness, <laughs> and like I I really think it it drives the like uh, attic response because you feel like all of these hoops that you have to go through just to do the simple act of, of printing something. So I thought that was really uh, well done. Uh, my I wish for you guys is. Uh, for both the click exercise and the, the first journey map you shared. Uh, I actually think you could have done a little bit more framing uh, before getting into it because I think those both visually were so powerful and compelling um, that um, if, if a little more time was spent on the introduction, I think you could even reach broader audience um, instead of some people feeling needing to catch up to what those visualizers were showing and realize like, oh wow, those are really important. Uh, I think the setup uh, could have been, there could have been more. Sure. Did he freeze for you? Oh, am I frozen? Hello? No, I'm only frozen for you. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, my, my I wonder uh, for your group is, I wonder if it's possible to take the way you guys did the diagram. I don't know if the, your journey maps, if you pulled it from an existing um, method of, of journey mapping, but like it would be a really cool like drag and drop research instrument to like give people like just, horizontally of like the actions that they do and then just like use like sliders to like drag up and down like their delight or ease and then like do that at scale. I, I, I think um, even for like just the printing thing, I think it could be a really cool iterative uh, research instrument based on the way it was visualized. Cause I, I, really powerful. Thank you.
Go ahead and unmute yourself. If are you able to unmute yourself? I think you are, Nick. Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Thanks, Rashad. Um, I really liked that it seemed like everyone in the in the group spoke and contributed. Um, that was really nice to hear from a bunch of different perspectives. Um, I also liked if I'm allowed to do two likes, Rashawn. That's good. Okay, thanks. Um, I also uh, the fact that you had a mock page to give us an idea of what you imagine things might look like. Um, so even just having the list directly to the Google Drive calendar, I thought that was, I mean, because for, for me personally, I think, and a lot of other people, we have different tabs devoted to all these things, but having one space to do it is super simplifying. Um, I wish that, I think as Rashawn said, so I'm not, I'm not going to repeat what he said, but framing kind of framing of the problem would have been just a little bit useful um and i wonder how long it would take if uh the tech department learned of your suggestions to implement something like this awesome and you know there's a couple of other questions um that are still in the chat so members from group one you can continue the dialogue going there uh, but what I would like to do now, because my watch is um, signaling that our feedback time is done, I'd like to transition over uh, to group two. And um, this is like Sherry, Todd, Becca, Jessica, Yaran, and uh, Ali. Hi everyone, I'm Allie and I'm one of the people that's in this group. Um, I'm Becca, yeah, I'm, I'm Becca. also I'm in group two. Um, hello, I'm Yara, I'm also in group two. And my name is Todd and I um, am in this group and then we have Jessica, who is in Atlanta, but but here electronically as well. Jessica, do you want to say? Hello. Slightly unreliable hotel Wi-Fi. Um, so uh, as we go and start our presentation, we want to actually invite uh, feedback on not only the content, but on the style of our presentation as we will be using explain everything and trying to share everything. Um, so we are picturing ourselves at a, a middle school uh, that has a new makerspace and that makerspace is not fully outfitted, but it is growing. And we've been connected with a history teacher who wants to use the makerspace um, to enhance the study of Roman architecture that uh, they are currently doing in their classroom. Um, and so our goal is to apply design thinking to the study of Roman architecture. And in doing that, we've kind of come up with just a little uh, take on the standard weight bear challenge. Right, so they build a weight bearing structure that supports the most weight. That is their general um, idea that they're going for. But we want to put some different parameters on that. The first is to really connect to the classroom is that they need to study three Roman structures. And after studying three Roman structures, they're gonna choose one aspect that they've observed in those structures and integrate it into their design. And then that design needs to be no larger than a shoebox. And that would be like the footprint of the design. It can obviously expand above the shoebox, but we're looking to keep them from designing things the size of tables. We've been asked to have uh, four classes and we're picturing those classes as 45 minute classes, which means not a lot of time, 45 minutes to an hour. So as a result, 
we have some pretty basic goals here. And our class one goal, we're going to review safety and orient the students to this space. We're assuming that they haven't spent a lot of time here before. Um, so we want to let them know what tools are available and, and really what the, the space is capable of. We're going to introduce the challenge. And um, students will choose the aspect that they're hoping to integrate and to begin sketching their design and choosing their materials. In the next class two goals, uh, they need to kind of check in with a teacher. We're calling this a teacher checkpoint, and that checkpoint will be that their materials list and their sketch is presented. Um, and then they have the remainder of the class to build. So they're really uh, starting to utilize the tools and the materials there. Class three, they're looking to finish building the prototype and start uh, working on a presentation to explain the design and, the inf and how Roman architecture is influencing their design. And then on the final goal, final class, sorry, um, the prototypes are being tested with the weight. Um, they're getting feedback from their peers and they are gonna reflect and brainstorm modifications of their design. Now, a key aspect, as we know, of uh, design thinking is that iterative thinking, the ability to go back and change and uh, rebuild. But really, in four classes, we do not have that amount of time. So we decided that the best way we would work that in is to have them um, reflect and brain how they would change and potentially build in the future. So really, how we're planning and hoping this to look like is that students, just with simple Google or maybe something that a teacher is providing them with, they're gonna go and they're gonna, you know, do a very standard Google image search. But as they do that, hopefully they're gonna pick up on certain themes right away. They're gonna pick up on the columns that they see in a lot of the major buildings. They're gonna see the arches that exist quite often. And uh, a group that's a little bit more patient might notice the vaulted arch that appears quite often as well. So once they've picked aspect, they might zoom in on a pretty, again, a standard image, but hopefully their minds are going to work at this point. So I'm now at the purple circle there of the, the D-Labs iterative process of observe. They're now trying to figure out exactly what they are observing, what might be helpful to integrate into their design and it might lead them to try to actually find diagrams as well and this diagram might really make their minds work about oh what are these terms hopefully they're uh, looking more for help uh, from teachers and whatnot but trying to think about exactly what they want theirs to look like another group though might go through the same process with columns all right, so they might be looking at uh, one of these older buildings and saying, what exactly are the columns doing? How are they connected? How are they together? And again, leading them to a diagram, not just pictures. Um, and then at that point, it's up to them to uh, come together and build their prototype and uh, test their prototype. So uh, that is our idea and plan. And uh, thank you for your time. And then we will also uh, take any questions if so Tor Tori has posted some Tori from NLU has posted um, I like I wish and what if uh, statements there if you want to read and respond somebody from group two. Okay, so in, in response to, there was a question about the, um, if they didn't finish the goals from the class for that day. So I had also sort of talked about adding a little bit of maybe a homework component to it, um, just because we thought that this project was really important and there could be some work done. So maybe 
we had set up sort of by the next class that checkpoint had to be completed so if the students didn't finish in class then there would have to be some sort of arrangement made for working outside of class or being able to come prepared to the next class with that checkpoint completed because it kind of gives them a little bit of autonomy in the process too they are middle students they're older they have to take a little extra responsibility so that's what we were thinking in terms of if the goals don't get met for that specific class um, but that was something we considered and something that was challenging I think for us to figure out and I think I know for a lot of teachers that's something that's tricky is like when you have a plan and trying to figure out what happens if you don't meet that plan I have a question um, explaining is actually one of my favorite apps to use with my students I use it to teach um, math because I have I'm a dual language teacher so I don't I can never find any videos in Spanish so I create my own have you used the explain everything collaboration feature I know it's like fairly new but I haven't used it since I don't I didn't know anyone else um, who uses it have you guys considered that uh, no and and it is definitely a new software to me. We're lucky enough to have Rashawn um, both demonstrate the capabilities of the project, the prop of the software, um, and be nice enough to help us along the way. And it that's why we decided to use Explain Everything for our presentation to just force us to push ourselves to software to uh, make the mistakes in a uh, friendly setting. And uh, there's a lot of capability that we did not touch, but this is the first time um, we have really used it in any sort of presentation. Mode. Yeah, I see somebody question about having like an expert come in too. Um, and I think that would be a really good addition also to give students a different perspective, um, maybe even on Skype to incorporate more technology. That was a really good suggestion. So thank you. Um, I think, can we hear me? Because it doesn't pop up. Yes. Okay. Um, no, I know. So I think our take on um, our challenge was to really leave it op as open as possible and really allow high school age students to use the space to explore as much as possible. Um, so our design challenge, we put parameters in place, but tried to limit the amount of parameters that there were. So we have a certain size limitation. Um, they have to use an aspect of Roman architecture. That's what's being assessed. Um, but they um, really it's up to them to create a structure using that architecture to hold as much weight as possible so really wanted to focus on the challenge aspect and have students kind of rise to that challenge great guys so yeah our our feedback session uh, is almost uh, up and Wonderful job. I, I really commend you on, um, you know, trying to stretch the uh, um, limits of what you um, can do, especially doing a screen share from a Chromebook. Uh, I think that's, that was interesting because, you know, often, especially things in the Google ecosystem are more optimized towards the platform. So I think it plays much more nicely with like Google Hangouts. Uh, but that's good to know that Zoom seems viable even from a Chromebook. So um, that was cool to see um, that that part of it um, modeled. So just like the other group, there there's uh, questions and conversations still uh, in the the chat. So folks from group one two can still uh, engage in the dialogue there, and uh, we'll we'll transition over now uh, to group three. So this is uh, Paula's group and uh, and company. Okay. So hi everyone. We're gonna set up the screenshot. I'm just gonna put a link into the chat box. That's the link to our slide. You guys can go back. We're going to, um, and look at it anytime you want. Um, did you share the? No, not share. Okay. Yeah. It's here on the bottom. Hopefully, yeah. we're just getting the screen set up now. 
There we go. So we also chose the same project as um, group two, where we were focusing on middle school, high school, but the idea was really thinking about how we can um, integrate different subjects together. Um, in our group, we have uh, myself, um, Erica, Feifan, Jingshang, Nahida, Paula, Rocio, and Ji Jing, sorry, uh, if I pronounced it wrong. If you, I think you're here, you can correct me, but anywho. Um, and so now we're going to move on to uh, Rocio, who will explain the next part. Great, thank you, Erica. So the big purpose for our project is to design a transdisciplinary learning experience. And by this, we mean that we are connecting meaningfully different content areas, social studies, because of the focus in Roman architecture and art, ELA, because students will, will be conducting research, uh, presenting the research orally and also presenting it through writing. The arts, because the creations will in, incorporate an art component and STEM areas because they will be using technology to share and conduct research and mathematics for the design of their prototype. So it is an authentic project uh, in the context of a makerspace that will span over four sessions. We thought of two hours for each session. We will include a museum visit as part of the exploration and research components of our project, and then three sessions in the makerspace. And we were looking at a ninth grade or high school class in New York City public schools. Um, I'm going to, my name is Paula. Um, I just have to go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Battery almost. Um, okay. So my name is Paola, and I'm going to talk about the learning goals. So before we decide how the activities would flow throughout the four sessions, we, we really thought about what, what were the learning goals we, we needed to have. So we thought first, um, students will know about the main innovations developed in ancient Rome. Um, second, students will know that ancient civilizations developed lasting cultural achievement. Um, students will reflect upon the concept of innovation, both in ancient Rome and contemporary society. We wanted them to make this link. Um, students will be able to propose a solution to a complex pro world problem through the creation of a prototype they will share. So they, they are studying ancient Rome, but they want, we want them to create something that's related to today. Um, and students will understand the concept throughout this whole process, will introduce the concept of design thinking to them. And students will be able to apply this concept of design thinking as they explore the possibilities in the makerspace. So one of the idea, one of the learning goals is also for them to get familiarized with the makerspace and the possibilities of creativity in this space. So I don't know if any of you have heard of design thinking before. If you have, could you just raise your hand just to get a... So it seems like a lot of uh, people have definitely heard of it before. So there's different models. Um, there's one by the Stanford Design School, which is the Emphasize, Define, Ideate, ideate Prototype Test, um, which is really popular. Um, in the corner of the slide, you can see one by Mitch Reisnick, who is a um, researcher at MIT who is talking about uh, the kindergarten model. Oh, Carla, I think you went back to, can you go back to the slide? Sorry. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. You went, <laughs> that's all right. Perfect. There we go. Um, and that one you can see, you have this idea of imagine, create, play, share, reflect. So it's another one. And then there's the deep model. Um, we really encourage you to explore the different design thinking models because they're really great. And so we decided to adopt our own for this project using discover and imagine. Um, discover and play, empathize, experiment, and create. And there's a link on our slides if you'd like to watch a really good video. I'll also post it in the chat um, where you guys can go and really think more about how you can fit design thinking into your own personal um, curriculum and what would work best in your situation. It's me again. <laughs> Uh, Paola, you might be muted, unless it's just muted for me. Uh, 
I can't hear her either. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. So for our first session, which is uh, the session of discovering and imagining, the students will be introduced to the project and to their big performance task, which is to come up with a solution to a real world problem and use inspirations from Roman architecture to create the solution in their communities and their school. So the first thing will be to uh, visit uh, the museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, and the section of uh, Roman art and architecture in order to conduct research, document what they see, take notes, take pictures and video, and bring this inf information and this knowledge back to the makerspace for the session number two. Okay, can you hear me? No. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. we can. Okay. Um, okay, so session number two. Um, it's going to be a session about discovery and play. Um, so they, the students select um, an artifact from, from ancient Rome and, and they, have to, they have to create a model of this. So this part of the, of the, of the, the four sessions is for them to think with their fingers and start getting um, ideas about what's possible with different materials. So they're basically just making a, a model. They're at this point, because we only have a session, we only have two hours, they're not going to use a 3D printer or maximum, they, they might use the laser cutter, but it's mostly with um, scrap materials. It's also the idea of them envisioning a maker space, not necessarily as a space only to use digital fabrication, but they can also invent with other materials. And as and once they're done, their their model, which will make them think more deeply about um, these structures, um, they'll create a video using Shadow Puppet um, to to share their productions. We we really believe this kind of work there has to be a sharing moment, so so there can be feedback and and all that for next iterations and better projects to come. So after this first experience with materials and um, visualizing Roman uh, concepts and Roman innovation, they will start their design and final project, which is identifying a real world problem or a need or a wish in their communities, in their schools, and propose a solution applying the inspirations from Roman architecture. Uh, so they will be creating a scale blueprint as part of this process and math concepts such as measurement, ratios, area, and perimeter will be included and will be the criteria for success for this part of the project. And finally, they will create a build, they will build, sorry, a scale prototype of their solution and share this solution with their classmates. Um. May I say something really fun? Yes. One thing that we decided that's very important in a project like this is that we'll have to have office hours in the makerspace with the makerspace coordinator for them to be able to go back and explore more of the, the possibilities and different tools for them to be able to think about their final project, which will happen in the two last sessions. And for the fourth session, which is the last one for these projects, students will finish their prototypes and share their creations with the class in a maker first style. And this will be an opportunity for classmates to provide feedback to the work of other groups and also to reflect and share how they would improve um, their creations as a part of a design thinking framework for problem solving. So Thank you for hearing and listening to our project and we're ready for questions. Thank you very much. So there's a lot of uh, text uh, again in the, in the chat um, and a lot of great comments, especially, uh, you know, around uh, some interesting comments around Google products like Earth, Google Maps, Google Expeditions as one way to kind of bring in close. I also was thinking about the, the portal, and I wonder if yeah. some sort of portal experience, um, and Lucy, uh, NLU uh, folks, 
you may not be familiar, uh, but Don is doing this kind of pop-up portal uh, over at Marymount, but it's just this really interesting, immersive, uh, well, portal uh, that some, that could be an interesting kind of hook um, to bring students closer to that. You should, um, I'm trying to, uh, Shared Studios is the name of it. And it's, um, um, for lack of a better explanation, it's kind of a mylar small room that pops up that they build. And, um, and it's like Skyping in your real size, I guess, is how I would describe it with um, people in Iraq or Afghanistan that this, this group is, has coordinated on the other end. And they have kind of semi-permanent pop-ups in different cities that you can go to, but then your school can also pay for it and have this thing come into your school. It's really cool. I had a question about standards. We talk a lot in our class about the ISTE standards um, because there's a specific set for coaching. And I know, you know, I think they're, the ISTE standards, um, if you're not familiar with them, International Society for Technology and Education, I think they've improved in the last iteration that they've done. They've done, they've redone the student ones and then we've done the teacher ones. And I think are working on administrator ones right now. But anyway, part of it, we refer to them quite a bit when we're talking about um, our work. When you're talking about your learning goals, where do you drive inspiration for those learning goals? Does it really matter if you're connecting to standards, like social studies standards, or I know probably a lot of you are coming from international and private schools where that stuff isn't as important, but I'm just wondering where your learning goals came from um, and if you look at any kind of standards at all. So for this project, uh, we looked at the NGSS, so the Next Generation Science Standards. We also looked at the New York Social Studies Standards and Common Core. So we do believe it's important to take uh, these learning goals from the standards and make it authentic and transdisciplinary. So it's an opportunity for students to learn and be able to uh, show that they understand and they, are, they know what the standards require them to know but also in an engaging, creative, and meaningful project, through a meaningful project. Okay, that sounds great. I was just at the American School of Bombay um, for a conference, and the kids there could articulate exactly what they were working on. And I think ASB has, has kind of adapted their own standards. They're not an IB school anymore, except, except in the high school. Um, so it's kind of like they've taken the best of different worlds with standards and goals and made it their own. And then the kids really, really, I was really impressed with these middle school kids that were showing us projects. They knew exactly what they were working on. And they'd also had a lot of dialoguing with their teachers with it too. So that might be an aspect you could, if there's an aspect of dialogue with the teacher reflect, you know, in this process, that would be also awesome too. Thank you. All right, so let's let uh, group four. Um, so this is uh, Rani and Valerie and company uh, get set up. Uh, I'm gonna just share my uh, I like. Uh, I really liked how your group, again, like used elements of the medium, uh, feeding links uh, into the chat, but also kind of alerting us uh, to that, like giving the audience different options for how they engage, uh, I think is, um, it's really thoughtful because that's something that you can do. Um, when doing this distance-based type of interaction. So I, I thought that was well done. We all set, Rashawn? All right, y'all. Um, can I do this? We'll see if this works. Perfect. Um, so uh, I just figured we take a quick second to introduce ourselves. So if uh, members of the team who contributed wanted to chime in, that would be terrific. I'm Nick. Uh, this is Yo-Yo. Uh, this is Yo-Yo. I, I don't know what happened to my camera. This is JQ. <laughs> Hi everyone, this is Avery. And we also have 
like number two group members, Rennie and Valerie. So, so in terms of framing our problem, uh, we took, it's great that the groups three and two already gave you an example of uh, kind of the problem and sketched it out. Um, so we targeted ours a little bit more towards uh, a high school audience, I think, with um, some previous exp experience in the makerspace. So they would know their way around and they have a little bit of experience. So it was designed towards a little bit more familiar audience. Uh, kind of a general overview of the project is kind of a, a two-dimensional scaled down uh, SketchUp exercise, not Google SketchUp, but um, kind of a, a SketchUp exercise, uh, which then moves to actual 3D um, manipulation. So it's kind of their actual art version one, which we then uh, set in our third session to uh, 3D arch print. And then the final is presentation, kind of gallery walk, uh, opportunities for feedback. Um, so the week uh, one kind of 2D build is this idea of a square division. So by giving students a constraint saying, okay, um, we're going to give you a square and you're going to give you one line. And we're going to ask you to divide it. You can see just like a number of different ways students might choose to divide um, a square. And just this idea of like kind of lateral thinking and sharing with neighbors or sharing around um, just gets students in this idea of thinking very differently. Um, around a very simple prompt with a single constraint. Uh, the exercise can be replicated into um, two lines, four lines, however many lines. But basically it builds to this, which is given the same square, uh, we're gonna ask you to divide into seven compartments. Uh, and the seven pieces are gonna require three congruent pairs and one non-congruent pair. So we just took some examples um, that, we, we, that we kind of um, coded up and uh, then we actually went um, on to, once students are, are here, and I think you know, these are very, very different, and you can have some, stu some students that are, um, that are very, some student examples that are very basic and some that are, are not very basic. Um, then we actually would expect students to uh, draw these out and cut them up. And to kind of introduce this challenge, so we basically took three of these designs and cut them up, we would say there's a start and there's a finish, and you need to build a some kind of structure that spans across but the only caveat being that your pieces can't overlap you can join them in any in any way so like obviously like it looks like these would not be joinable at all kind of in in reality but as long as the pieces don't overlap um just kind of getting them a different idea of how things might might work um and so you can move the start and the finish blocks very close to one another um or you can move them very far apart from one another and students have to use their pieces in different ways. They, they also may have to design their constraint in a very different way. Um, and it just turns out in kind of the third one, you can see how the same set of pieces can, be, can fit together very, very differently. And this is a complete fluke, honestly, that this one, I mean, Yo-Yo is sitting right here, she can, she can tell you that we actually looked like, there's actually one that looks a bit like an arch. Um, that was totally not by design, but it worked out for the presentation. Um, in a week two, we're gonna take this up a notch and ask them to kind of replicate the exercise. So span a gap um, given uh, wood blocks. So we're moving from two dimensional space to a three dimensional space. Um, and here's where we're gonna actually start to introduce students to this idea of, oh, okay, we'd like you to go back and start to draw on some of the Roman history that you, you all have been studying. Um, so kind of the first variant of the exercise is that they'll cut 11 pieces. So we've moved from kind of seven pieces to 11 pieces, but we didn't think that that transition was a super um, important one to acknowledge. Also given the fact that if it's a small piece of paper, cutting into 11 pieces is a lot more cognitively demanding than seven pieces is. Um, and you can even see with like kind of a simple example like this, we get to, before we, before we stress test this, I'm just gonna go ahead a slide you get to kind of different ideas for how these things might take shape. Um, and they give you very different ideas of how students might think about joining these things. Uh, the, the end goal is basically getting asked to ask students to stress test these and figure out, you know, how much um, weight they, these can hold. And more weight, obviously, is going to be um, managed by more reinforced structures than, than the one that's being spanned and shown here. 
But this really is going to prompt the following questions. So like an observation of why things held out so long and students can do this reflection individually before they share out. Um, and why is this perhaps not a feasible design? Um, because I think the idea that we'd like to pr produce is the fact that once the span gets larger to use this same model, the design is going to have to be enormously tall. And then similarly, well, why can't you just do this? It's because, again, without like steel or some kind of other reinforcement, this is also not going to work. Um, so kind of at the end of class, this says technically week three, but kind of previewing week three, um, we're going to get into a space where we're asking students to go back to their research and go back, it, well, either research they've done previously or go dig into some new research into what does the Roman arch actually look like. So hopefully soon they'll unearth the fact that um, these are going to be based on concentric circle, concentric semicircle models. It's fine. I'll be fine. A concentric semicircle models. This one won't work. Um, sem uh, concentric semicircle models. And then how they choose to divide those is, to some extent, going to be up to them. But we're going to ask them to stick with within the kind of the eleven piece framework, um, drawing on principles of symmetry and a little bit of trigonometry. Um, and the fact that this is not a mathematics class didn't really bother us at all. I think the, the whole point of going to a makerspace is to use the materials in the makerspace and to draw in as many different disciplines, hoping to kind of redefine what those disciplines entail. Uh, here, I'm going to switch over to Avery. And um, Avery, I can continue to advance the slides, but um, if you want to. OK, thanks, Nick. Can everyone hear me OK? OK, great. So I uh, just wanted to continue on to the hands-on example. Um, because I managed the makerspace at Teachers College, we were actually able to try these activities out for ourselves. Um, so the next step the students would take is after they've created their paper model, uh, they would be measuring the sides of the model with calipers. The goal was to have symmetrical shapes on either side with one keystone in the center. So when students go to create a digital model, they actually only have to create six pieces and then replicate five of them in order to create their arc. Um, so what they're doing is they're taking their calipers on their physical drawing and they're going to take them into Tinkercad. And I don't know if anyone's worked with Tinkercad before, but it's an incredible program. It's free. It's available online. And, and yeah, you can sign up as a teacher and have a class be a part of it. And I've worked with this with fifth graders. Um, so it doesn't allow a lot of freedom in the creation of shapes, but I did find a community shape called a uh, misspelled awkward trapezoid. <laughs> so you can see that awkward trapezoid is there, but it does allow you to actually input sizes for base width, top width, et cetera, et cetera, so you can make a really precise shape. So it's just a matter of kind of going through different possibilities with Tinkercad and seeing if it can apply to your project. And in this case, we were able to build these specific shapes for our arch. Uh, so I created my shapes. I labeled them with a number so that students knew where they were supposed to go in their arch. And then we printed it out using the 3D printer. Uh, so if you can see me on the camera, I'm holding up the little physical form of the arch. Uh, you can also see in the slideshow images of it being printed. Uh, this offers a little bit of a logistical issue because it takes a good amount of time to do each of these prints. So we would ask that the technician would get these prints completed in between class sessions since there is a week in between so that when the students arrive for the last class, the pieces are already printed. So when they, when they come in on the last class, their model is finished and they can start experimenting with the arch and that's when they see that they can actually span a wider space with this type of shape and they can start doing weight testing. So the hope is that in their reflection uh, period at the end of the fourth session, they're learning a little bit about the Roman arch and why exactly it was so innovative. So that hands-on experience with the materials is giving them this really, really full sense of the importance of this uh, innovation and why it was used so heavily in Roman architecture, why it allowed for more monumental design, um, and the fact that that keystone shape is what allows the weight to be distributed between the two spaces. So this is a really great example of how a hands-on activity for kids can really deepen that learning that's going on in class. So while you can learn in the first session that Roman architecture is um, innovative and that the arch was part of that innovation, actually physically doing it with pieces really drives that lesson home. Okay, that's all I have. So if there's any questions, we'll open it up to that. 
Uh, Good job. You finished right at 10 minutes. Perfect. I loved it. That was great. All these presentations were <laughs> great. Um, the one thing I'm thinking about from my students' perspective is if they're going to be technology coaches or innovation coaches in a school, this is the kind of thing that they need to know about or think about or think deeply about and be able to take to a teacher and say, hey, have you thought about doing this and how we can integrate it into your curriculum? And the person I'm thinking of, of this who does this really well, um, Rashawn, is Karen Blumberg. Um, she, if you guys haven't seen her blog, she's a, she used to work for Don and is a good friend of all of ours. And, and she, she's so smart and, um, and also really good with math that she can say to a teacher, have you ever thought about this? And so I think as technology coaches, you have to be able to think deeply about this stuff. So because maybe the people you're working with are too busy to, <laughs> and so you can make a suggestion and, and, and hopefully it will work, but really nice, really nice job, everyone. Thank you. Yes, I think as a makerspace facilitator, it's really important to come with these package lessons and be really ready to adapt because teachers are so busy and stressed out. So if you're lucky enough to have someone in the school who's able to kind of create that and bring it as a package to the teacher, that's definitely the best thing. Or even just being so familiar with the tools that you know instantly how to integrate it into what's going on in the other classrooms. I, I even the terms like with like, you know, packaged or templates, like to me, I like to think of them as like scaffolds. So like you have an arsenal of different scaffolds that you can like drop in and then like, you know, suitably, you know, get the teacher or their content or their uh, approach to instruction and assessment um, and lead them towards it. So I think uh, as future and current technology leaders in all these spaces, like think about, you know, like your toolkit of like how you can bring in uh, not like just like drop and go like, you know, terrible like textbook curriculum, but like systems that you know you, you work, you own, uh, but you have the, the capability to kind of like adapt and adjust it to the situation. So it's a great point, Avery. And I think to... Oh, uh, unmute Nick. Oh, sorry, thanks. Um, I think that, you know, Erica had shared a, a comment that this is very similar to a Montessori problem. Um, and the fact that, you know, I've used a very similar problem in BC calculus classes uh, for students, because it's all about the underpinning. I mean, this is, this is mathematics, really. It's about identifying something that is at, the, at a very base level, can be interesting and creative and accessible, but also can be a... Um, assimilated at a, at a high level as well. And I think, to, you know, to Avery's point about having these things, like uh, a great resource is the Phillips Exeter problem set, um, their mathematics problem set, which is open and includes a lot of these very open-ended, um, there, there are a lot that are not easy, but there are many that, that have a, a very low bar for an audience, um, which I think to build an arsenal for, for someone looking to build an arsenal to, that integrates mathematics into a lot of different ways, um, it's a great resource. So do you think, I think math teachers are the hardest to work with in terms of technology coaching. Um, typically they want to be on page 122 by September 3rd and they can't deviate from it. Am I wrong on that? I think I'm very, I have, I have one math teacher in my group and she may, she may argue with me, but I feel, I feel like there's a strong high school math teachers especially have to stick to the content. So this is the kind of project, this is the kind of deep, rich project that I think is, would be really motivating to a teacher. It's not that math teachers can't do this, they, they can. It's just the time and the constraints and find, you know, getting around that sort of thing. So I think this is really, so Stephanie agrees sometimes. Um, but anyway, I think this is really appealing to teachers who want to do something deep and um, apply the learning. Oh, and that's also, I'm going to put this link in the, in the text. Is this the math problems that you were talking about, um, the Exeter? Let me see if I can find it. I just had it. Let me find it. I'll put it, I'll put it in the chat, and if it's the right thing, let me know. Uh, just to want to share that resource with people. Can you mute yours so that it doesn't do the crazy feedback thing? Yeah. Hey, hey uh, Nick's group, awesome presentation. I and my I wonder is I wonder how the history teacher um, reacts giving up class and whatnot, and then receiving such a math heavy lesson. So 
I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you guide the teacher through those moments or how you prep the teacher for the fact that this is not going to be what he or she might think of a, um, um, yeah, so it's funny because I don't see this as a math heavy lesson at all. So I'm very, so it's, so it's great that that was the perspective that, uh, that you, that you took it as, um, because I think a lot of the reflective piece and a lot of the in-class research that we thought students would engage in was directly tied to um, kind of the historical architecture and the innovations. Um, another group, uh, another member of our group, Valerie, who I'll give a shout out to here, and Valerie, you can chime in as well, um, is really, it really did emphasize the fact that in the presentation, kind of scaffolding the presentation element in such a way that students are then saying, okay, this is what I created, this is where I see examples of this in Roman architecture, and this, these are the problems that it, that it solved. So I think prompting the question of, you're right, you're right, Todd, prompting the question of like, okay, when you have a short span versus a wide span, what's really the issue? You know, what, how, why, why does this create a problem? And then realizing what an innovation um, the Romans gave to the world world in kind of uh, making making this making this work. Uh, I don't know if that really answers your question. Result. I think JQ is trying to share, but it's a little hard to hear her. So I can actually share what JQ wants to say on the assignment. It doesn't specifically said this activity is designed for history teacher. It's designed for, you know, all teacher. If you can, you know, combine different curriculum, it's awesome. And you probably can pick like one aspect to, you know, focus on. So what we design, we're thinking we want to we want to show like lessons more. We want to focus on one thing and dig in. So in this whole process, students might learn something else. You know. Um. Terrific. I think somebody. I don't know if somebody was about to say something and then muted, but that's okay. I think we can use this as our. Uh, our, our, our wrap up point. Um, this was a lot of fun. I think this was a, a neat way to, to try to conduct class now in, in New York. I think there's like a monster snowstorm, another one coming. So like get to safety. I've already <laughs> gotten notice that my kid's school is canceled. I think TC is closed tomorrow too. So if we had class, um, it's too, it's good. I guess they're not going to run it over Zoom, Risk. right? Probably not. Um, and, and, and maybe in Illinois, I don't know. I think we had have some another snow and rain earlier today. We had snow and rain earlier today. I don't know if we're supposed to get nailed or not. I've been getting, ignoring the weather for a while because it's been decent. Um, but anyway, this has been lovely, everyone. I really, really enjoyed seeing all these projects. They were all great. And um, I loved the conversation in the chat. So if you didn't have a chance to see everything, um, make sure you go to the more button at the bottom of the chat room and save it if you can. If not, I'll send it to Rashawn so he can share it with you guys and you can look at it um, in hindsight. Uh, also, I'm thinking that maybe some of you want to connect um, outside of class. And so if you want to put your Twitter handle in the chat too, um, that might be a good way to find people and follow them. And if you, are you guys using a hashtag for your class too, out of curiosity, Rashawn? <laughs> This year and last year, we also we we've we've subtracted the the mandatory um, requirement of Twitter. So not everybody in the class is using it, though a few are using it as their space. Um, so um, I would say that the best way might be to oh well, they're they're sharing their handles. Uh, your students are so that's terrific. But uh, uh, I I can help be the 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 connector between uh, us if if there's folks you want to reach out to um, okay. outside of the Zoom. Let's let that out. We don't, we haven't been, they had to, to visit some Twitter chats and that sort of thing, but we haven't been doing a lot on Twitter with our, uh, ourselves. But when I do find something that I think is interesting to my students, I use the hashtag Thai575. So you guys can always look at that and we'll look at your hashtag and maybe we'll glean some resources from each other as we um, 
as we continue. When does your course end, Rashan? You guys started later than we did. Uh, first week of May. Okay, so yeah, yeah. it's first or second week of May. Yeah. Yeah. So we're the quarter system, so we're done the end of March. But um, anyway, this has been great, you guys, and I just want right, to gotcha. thank you and enjoy yes, the rest. Thanks, of everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of South by um, Rashan, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye, everyone. Thanks for coming. Great. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Get home safe.